greet you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we want to greet those who are viewing us from our platforms, our streaming platforms. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, why don't we give another round of applause to our worship team. Thank you very much. God bless you. Hallelujah. Um, there was a, a word that came here earlier on through my Magumi say that there's a person who has pain at the back of their head. Uh, we want to pray for you as pastors and elders. Do not go away. We want to be able to pray for you so that God will move in your life and that God will heal you. Amen? So don't go away. Um, well, uh, before I, I go on, there is a word. There is something that has been in my spirit, and it's, um, it's just to exhort. Uh, I can't expand on it too much um, for other reasons. But God brought a picture of some many years ago. Um, when we were at Majika Day, uh, Sanganai camp uh, site, as men. I think we were men or young people, I'm not sure now. My mind is, is not clear there. Uh, there were some horses there that after we would have had our sessions, would have sports, would have, would ride horses and so on. Um, so I had not ridden a horse in a very long, well, ever. <laughs> not even in the wrong, ever. I never ridden a horse, not even a donkey. Um, so I decided I would try it this time. So I got onto the horse, uh, you know, um, and then you've got to be settled correctly. And then you've got to know how to do the reins and so on. Just as I was trying to settle down. The horse bolted at full speed. And I kept holding on to the reins, and my, I was now on the side of the horse, and my leg was just going like this on the horse, my, my left leg. It bolted, and people actually thought that I was just being me. See, that's a problem sometimes when you joke. They thought that I will eventually, I'm an experienced horse rider, and that I will get back um, to my senses and then I'll ride the horse properly. No, the horse went on. Now, it was bolting out of the campsite, and in my mind, there was a few things that were happening. How long is this going to go on? And, and yet, the people who were around me, or the people who were cheering me on, they didn't realize that this was a whole mistake. Things had gone so wrong, but everybody thought, no, 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 he'll be okay. Uh, it went on now. I began to say, okay, how long is this going to be? Number two, I said, look, if I drop, it's going to stamp on me with his hind feet, and I'm going to be a disaster. So I kept holding, and also as it is moving, it is moving through trees, rocks, and so on. So whichever way, I was going to just hurt myself. But I longed to drop off. I longed to just, just get off this horse. My legs were sore, my hands were sore, and I knew if I dropped, I was going to get hurt. But long story short, as it was there, I eventually said, Kusiru so I dropped off. <laughs> the moment I dropped off, the horse stopped. I couldn't walk. The horse didn't come for me. From that day onwards, I have not ridden a horse. <laughs> um, so, as humorous as it sounds, God brought this to me, and he said, this could be the situation we find ourselves in right now. And at some point, we need to get off the horse. Because some of us are hurting. Some of us do not like the ride. And yet, people actually think you're enjoying the ride. And this is what the psalmist says in Psalm 69. And, and he cries out and says, save me, O God. For the waters have come upon to my neck. 
I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than their hairs of my, the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me because my enemies wrongfully, being my enemies wrong, wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. I like the last portion. It says, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. And then you fast forward. The Lord comes through, actually. The Lord always comes through. So this is an exhortation. You might be feeling like me on that horse. The Lord will come through for you. Psalm 124, verse 1 to 8. says, if, I had not, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, um, then <clears throat> they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over my soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. It's important that we get into our closets and shut the door. This is not a time of trying to rationalize whatever you're going through. Seek the face of the Lord. Seek his heart. Seek his mind. Be guided by him accordingly. Because if it was not for him, we would have been destroyed. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Our, our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I just thought I would encourage you it's an exhortation, but just for you to contextualize your situation, that short of just dropping off, it is just going to be sore, more painful, and even can hurt you, but trust in the Lord, that even when I dropped off that horse, I didn't drop on a, on a rock, I didn't crush my head, the horse did not stamp on me, I just dropped off, and that God saved me. Of course, I can't tell you the weeks I couldn't walk properly because the, all my muscles were gone. But I would still say, my help came from the Lord. Amen? So let's recap. We are talking about missional. Uh, we are talking about um, our giving, um, our material giving. We have not taught properly or we have not taught concisely in this church about giving, tithing, offerings, and giving. So this is the reason why we are having to take it as a series under missional. And the last time uh, we spoke at the very beginning about will a man rob God? And then we followed it up with why we tithe. Today we're going to talk about offerings. Uh, so the theme for this year has been hashtag Taking territory. Is that correct? Hashtag taking territory. But the subheadings to it is sonship, discipleship, and missional. So along the, along the season that we've gone through from January, we have handled sonship and discipleship in one way or the other. What we haven't handled is missional. And we're trying to handle it now in the last quarter of this year. Thank you all for your generosity. You have been a giving church, I must tell you. I think I, I cannot, on behalf of the pastors and elders here, I cannot stop thanking you like Paul would not stop thanking the Macedonian church for their giving. 
your sacrificial giving and your continuous giving. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord continue to uh, protect you, watch over you, and provide for all your needs according to his riches and glory. Offerings are gifts brought to God beyond tithes. Um, and the tithe was always uh, 10% of one's increase. But with offerings, God gave his people some discretion as to the amount or the number of offerings to bring. So this was given to us. God allowed us to give according to our own discretion, according to our heart. Tithes were never determined by ourselves. God, in his own way, determined that. The financial situation in life or the depth of your zeal for God would show the choice of offerings. Or if you go back into scripture, the, the offerings that will come through was, was, was dependent on their financial uh, position or situation, but also it depended on the condition of their heart to give uh, joyfully, to give according to their hearts. So offering was, um, uh, was determined by, uh, by their heart and not by God at all. The Old Testament offerings, although these were part of the law, it helps us to have a, a, a shadow, a picture of what God intended even in the Old Testament um, and to appreciate where we are now in the New Covenant. The bulk of the offerings were for, um, for sins and transgressions. Um, these are no longer necessary after the New Covenant. You read about this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 15. But God came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So, we are not going to address those offerings, which sometimes, even in this new covenant, are abused by certain preachers to try and get money or resources from the congregants. So, those which had to do with sins and transgressions, we're not going to handle them at all, uh, because they've been handled by the coming of Christ. What we are going to handle is the ones that I believe can continue even in the New Testament, even though they were in the Old Testament. But the sin offerings, the transgressions offerings, were taken away because of the coming in of the second Adam. Amen? Um, now let's talk about a few of them in the Old Testament. I'm going to go very quickly here. The first one is the first fruits. Exodus chapter 34, verse 19. All that, um, all that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock whether ox or sheep, goes on to talk about the donkey in, that, in the following scriptures, goes on to talk about the firstborn child. But let's talk about what will be, and that these ought to be redeemed. So you redeem the, the, the donkey, uh, so you ought not to sacrifice the donkey. And then you also must redeem your firstborn. You ought not to sacrifice your, your firstborn in the process. Um, uh, there was uh, the offering of the first fruits, which was a little offering taken uh, from amongst the earliest of other ripening fruits. So when the fruits were ripening, the early fruits were taken and given uh, to the priests or were offered into the temple. Uh, this offering was not in the form of money, but in the form of crops. So whatever was there, uh, crops, vineyards, and all the kinds of crops that they grew, 
uh, was then the first fruits, the first ripening of the fruits, the first mangoes, the first peaches, and so on, would be taken and given as an offering. So some of you would then say, where would they be put? It was given to the temple. It was given to the Levites. Uh, and then it was, they were eaten and they were shared amongst them um, uh, eventually. Um, it was required offering, but the amount of the first fruits brought to God was never specified. It was just what you felt was in your heart. So it didn't say all the first fruits, but it talked about the first fruits. Let's say it was crops. You just took the crops that were the first fruits. Your heart determined what was there. But if it was the firstborn of a, of a goat, you took that goat and gave it as, a, uh, as an offering. Um, of sheep, you did the same thing. Of, of cattle and so on, you did the same thing. So the first fruits. Now, how does this apply to our lives today? You run a business. What are your first fruits? Your first profits. You are employed. What are your first fruits? Your first salary. <laughs> That's the implication. Actually, when I, was, uh, when I started working, I don't think my father knew about these first fruits. I don't think he was that deep in the word. But um, he said, look, your first salary must come to your mom and I. So, <laughs> so my first salary, I gave it to my parents. I didn't even have my first salary. So sometimes we don't, we don't understand the connotations of all this, but I believe that there is a spiritual dimension of doing all this. When you give off your first, your best, when you're saying, this is, I want to buy a suit. Young people, I know, your first, your first salary, you want to buy all sorts of bling bling, your, all the shiny objects. Give it to the people that matter. Give it to your parents. Give it to your guardians. Give it to somebody who you know have played a critical path in your life. Give that first fruit. People don't want, you have, been, you have not been working. Can you imagine, you have not been working. Now the pastor is telling you, the first salary, give it to Oh, come on. Give me another uh, example. But that's what it meant. Whether you like it or you didn't, that is the implications for now. So the first fruits was given away. It was not consumed. So your first salary ought to go away. Tough. But gauge it in your heart and uh, assess it and talk to you, God about it. The second one is what is called a census offering. Exodus chapter 30, verse 14 to 15. Everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more. The poor shall not give less than half a shekel. Then you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for, the, for yourselves. So the, 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 the census offering was given after the census or before the census, you, you ought to give an offering. And I, I believe that God did this because there was always a cost related to some of these exercises. And he said, we're going to have a census, but we need to cover costs, maybe for food, maybe for people who are going to count the, uh, the people and so on and so forth. There was, and everybody above 20 years of age. Uh, these days, our voting age is 18. Uh, so in those days, it was 20 years. So 20 years and above, you paid a census offering. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking we, sh we need a census offering for BCC. And anybody above 20 years must pay something. It was uniform. Offering for all. The poor could not offer less and the rich could not offer more. This was a standard $100 for everyone. It was standard. It was the same amount. No one was asked to give more than the other. It was, this is for the census. And I believe there is a dimension to it because you don't count half a being or a quarter of a being. So God wanted that to be understood that where there was equal ministry, where there was equal uh, uh, ministration, that everybody was obliged to pay the same amount. So wherever there is need for certain things to be done to all of us, there must be a basic charge, not a minimum charge, but a basic charge for everybody to contribute towards 
that which needs, which benefits everybody. So there was a census charge. So what is that? What is that that benefits everybody? There must be an offering that we take that when we come to church, when we are in this community, that we pay that basic charge. For example, I know it comes through offerings the way we do it. We consume the electricity here. We consume the cleaning here. We, there are basic costs here that all of us do. None of us consumes more. So for, for example, the, the, the power that we utilize here. The poor consume exactly. They use the same light in the same breath as the rich. Um, uh, where we sit, if we were to clean it up, uh, we, don't have, we don't say the poor sit here and the rich sit on, the, or, or, on whatever, have better seats. We sit in the same places. These are charges that everybody enjoys equally. And we ought to feel, and I'm just trying to get to the bottom of this because there are certain people who feel that they are so poor that they are entitled not to give. There must be certain giving that is obligatory to you. Not because if you don't give, God will forsake you, no. But in your heart, there are certain gifts to say, look, I, I must give. If everybody else is giving this for us to have this, I must give in the equal measure. But God judges the hearts. God assesses the hearts. And I'm not saying that we must all now say, it's $100, everybody must do this. If you're not, you go and stay outside. Remember, it's going to the out there, not in church. At school. Your son is an A-class student. Your daughter is a, is a special needs student. Do you pay less or more for either of them? Just pay the same fees. That's how it equates. When you get onto a commuter omnibus, there are those of us who are blessed with size. There are those of us who are blessed with less size. Do you pay more or do you pay less? When you go to the barber, there are those of us who might never bold, but there are those of us who are bolding. Do you pay more or do you pay less? I asked my barber, by the way, and I said, um, so, and then he says, ah, same amount. Those ones, we actually want to charge more <laughs> because we have to be more careful. But anyway, we charge the same. Do you get the concept, saints? It is the same in the body of Christ. It is the same in the kingdom of God. We must feel that there are certain costs to advance the kingdom. There are certain costs that all of us must feel that we are obliged to meet. And not because we have or not because we don't have. We must all contribute towards that. All right. There's also the special projects offerings. Special projects offering, occasionally, there are offerings taken from the people for special occasions, such as the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And here's uh, what um, God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 to 8. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, said, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everywhere who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver. Bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins, uh, dyed red badger uh, skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet in essence, uh, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the effort and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. Where did these guys get this, the, this precious uh, stuff? Where did they get them? Remember, as they were leaving Egypt, God made a, a, grace, a gracious declaration that go and ask anything precious from the Egyptians. Get it? Now, you get gold. Along the way, you find that Moses goes up and they thought that that gold was for themselves. So they consumed it by creating 
a, 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 a golden calf, which God was, was, was angry with them and he smote them that day. But he says, get, get, what the, get what I gave them so that they can make this for me. So God never asks you to give something that you don't have as an offering. So they already had. On these occasions, God always responded with great generosity and, and joy. And, and the children of Israel are the most generous people on earth today. If you, if you ever, um, in one of my businesses, our partner, my partner is a, their partners are Jewish and they came here the other time last year. They're the most generous people you can think of, but very principled. They give according to how it must be done. Not carelessly, not recklessly, but they give because God demands that giving to them. When Moses announced to the people of Israel that God had told him to collect the offering and the materials and the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the people brought so much that Moses had to tell them to stop. Chapter 36, verse 5 to 7 says, They spoke to Moses saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work, which the Lord commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had uh, was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. It was too much. And God had to say, and Moses had to say, stop giving. I look forward to that day. <laughs> I look forward to that day. Where we say, stop now. Stop. It's enough. It's enough. We need to use what we have, been, what we have received so far. Um, but that was it. Never ignore church projects. So the offering. Never ignore church projects. At the moment, we would like to move from uh, uh, renewable energies. Instead of using the generator, it is costing us a lot of money um, to run the generator even for the meetings that we have here. It's unsustainable. It's chewing up a lot of your giving. So we need to jump into the renewable energies. We want to put solar here. It's going to cost us quite a bit, between thirty and 40000 U.S. dollars. So we will be coming and say, look, this is a major church project. How do you want to contribute towards it? I would like to come back and say, Pastor, you asked us to raise 40,000. We have now raised 50,000. And I have to say, stop now. Stop giving. We're going to come and ask. Because this will better the ministry. This will better what we do here. So yes, don't ignore church projects. They bring about such a, a, a blessing in the heart. Whenever we, we have been involved in church projects, my wife and I, there's not one church project in faith ministries we have not been involved in. Not one. Whether buying the roof or electrics or plumbing or bricks or cement or whatever you, just get involved. Put your hand there. Put your blessing there. Give something. Don't, 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 don't. Because God has a way of dealing with you in a particular, at a particular level. Not in the same way. He won't give back directly what you've given in. But uh, there's a grace that can come upon you as you do that. Do not. In those days they gave and God was delighted. Another offering is thanksgiving offerings. God provided a way for, uh, to express gratitude by commanding his priests to receive a thanksgiving offering on a willing basis. I just think that at the end of this year, we need, I know that it is difficult to thank God for what has happened this year because a lot of things have been quite painful. But that God had, has, has not allowed us to drown or to be caught in the snares, fowler, uh, has not allowed us to be washed away. We must always, at the end of the year, have a Thanksgiving offering. The Americans do it next month. They've got a Thanksgiving day. What date is it, by the way? The last of November, the last week of, uh, of, of November, or the last Friday of November, I think. They, they, they do that. 
and families get together. They give, they, they, they take out whatever was, was there and begin to bless one another. There must be a thanksgiving offering. As families, we need to do that. At the end of every year, let's have a, your own family going around and giving to the needy to say, thank you, Lord. Uh, and giving to those who desperately need that kind of help, whether it's financial, whether it's even your labor. Just go and spend an afternoon digging up and, and, and sowing maize and so on, planting things, so that you're saying, I'm grateful, Lord, that you've kept me this year this way and the way you have blessed us. So the Thanksgiving offering ought to always be part of what we do. Leviticus 22, verse 29. And when you offer... When you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free will. Do it because that's what you want. Psalm 50 verse 14. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Lord. Psalm 107 22. Let them sacrifice their sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. You remember that song uh, that was... We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer unto you a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And we offer unto you the sacrifice of joy and praise. Oh. You know that one? Now, we sing that. But what do you mean by the sacrifice of thanksgiving? What is it? Is it just because you're singing? Or you actually need to bring something to the Lord? Or you actually need to express that thanksgiving by giving to the church, by giving to the community, by giving to the family, by giving around you to just say, I'm grateful to what God has done to me. I'm thankful, Lord, I'm taking my jacket to give so and so. I'm buying grocery for so and so. This is just to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. That's a Thanksgiving offering. Let's keep going. There's now the welfare offering. And I'm going to dwell a little bit here because that's where offerings ought, I mean, tend to revolve around a lot. Welfare of God's people. as giving to the poor. The blessings in our hands are not only for us and our families, but also for the welfare of the less privileged. Uh, there will always be poor and needy people around us. And we have an obligation to offer help to them. Just understand that. Please do not frown at the poor. The gospel is pro-poor, by the way. It's for the poor. Remember when Christ um, is, is talking to John's disciples, he says, go and tell John what you hear and what you see. And he ends up and says that the gospel is being preached to the poor. It is pro-poor. So do not frown at the poor. And, and, and also, I'm not saying... Don't then go around and looking for every poor person and see what you can do because you'll also end up becoming poor. But, but don't frown at the poor. We need to be sensitive to the poor. Right now, with the collapse of our service delivery systems in this country, the poor are the worst hit. You just need to look at those who are involved in our health service delivery structures and facilities and systems they will tell you, the poor are the worst hit. You talk about transport. You talk about uh, food. Uh, you, all these have, have hit uh, the poor the most. Our environment has decimated the already poor. So we need to be sensitive to the poor. Deuteronomy 15 verse 11. For the poor will never cease from the land. This is God telling his people that Amongst you, the poor will not, will, will not eliminate. So, when I, when I talk to all these development agencies, the DFIs and so on, they tell you that we want to eradicate poverty. 
I tell them, you can reduce poverty, but you can't eradicate poverty. Because the word of God is true. Because the poor we will always have. And it is what God... Dem- now, they mustn't feel poor in our midst. Now, when, uh, when they're in our midst, we must be able to look after them so that they do not experience poverty. But to say poverty will never be on earth, it will be a lie. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your, to your poor and your needy in your land. We must always reach out to the poor. Even Jesus emphasized this point. Matthew 26, verse 10 to 11. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. But me, you do not have always. Paul was encouraged to not forget the poor. Galatians 2, verse 10. They desired only that we should remember the poor and the very thing which I also was eager to do. So the poor are at the center of God's heart. And here we go again. When you give to the poor, you are lending to God and God is no one's debtor. Proverbs 19, 17. Uh, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given. The word of God gives us confidence that if we give to the poor, we will not lack. Proverbs 28, verse 27. He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. The poor are at the center of God's heart. Giving to the poor guarantees more than just financial material blessing. Psalm 41, verse 1 to 2. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. So you enjoy a benefit when you look after the poor. So central to offerings is the plight of the poor. If in your heart you never do anything for the poor, I'm just encouraging you, wake up. Just begin to think of the poor around you. Begin to do something about the poor around you. In my own personal involvement, whether at a community level, at a national level, my eye has been tuned in to say, look, where are the poor here? When I look at our service delivery systems like the health sector, I'm asking myself, what more can I do to make sure that the poor are not decimated further? Cholera. Cyclone Idai. Right now, all that... Um, uh, giving that we did at the beginning of the year on Cyclone Idai, yes, has been good. But guess what? We're going into another rainy season. The same people are still without accommodation. They don't have a roof above their head. They're poor. And you don't have to have a, a, a collection amongst yourself. Just take a friend and go there and find out what is going on there. Our men have already started some work there, and we hope that that work will continue. Go out there and look for the poor. As you drive around, may your eye be focused. May your eye be alert to the poor around you. Sometimes the sacrifice you can do to the poor is when you see them doing business. Some of the people I buy from, I want to buy from them because I notice that if I don't buy from them, this man is going to their rent, and then I pay a little bit more. I like my, my, uh, my chibag, I like it almost daily, I want to have that. So I go to this guy, and I say, look, how much is it? And I have to pay more than, I would, than they are charging. Why? It's because I want them to get, to know that I want to bless them, because their condition, their situation is really coming out of poverty. So you don't always have to give handouts. Those who you see doing, practicing enterprise, trading, and so on, give a little bit more. Give them a bit of a push. God's heart is tuned to the poor. And when he sees you doing that, God actually protects your very lot that you think might be lost. God looks after you.
You know, you have to understand that when you are when you are dealing with the poor and you are in business, you are in enterprise, you've got to understand that much of your profits, directly or indirectly, you derive them from the poor. That must be sobering for the business people here. Let me repeat. Much of your profits, directly or indirectly, you're benefiting from the poor, either through their labor, either through their lack of understanding profit and enterprise, either through because of their disposition. Because let me tell you something about profit. Profit is selfish. Profit's motive is selfish. That's why it's profit. So when you make lots of money, just know that part of that money is actually leveraged on the back of the poor. Now, I don't want anyone to feel bad. I'm a businessman myself, so I'm not feeling bad. But what I am just then trying to tell you is that that's why you find many entrepreneurs and business people have to find a way of giving back to the poor. Because you are aware. And let me just explain this to you. Let's talk about a sector that I have been in for years, which is hospitality. When I travel in communities or in cities where I am known, they give me a huge discount or what they call complimentary accommodation. But guess who is able to pay for that? It's me. When the poor man wants to get into the same hotel, what happens? They have to pay. When I go around, there are certain benefits that I don't pay for because of who I am. But if a poor man was just to walk around in the same, they have to pay. So the rich or the, more, the wealthier you get, the less you pay. Just trying to bring some sanity here. And I don't want anyone to feel guilty about the millions you're making and the millions you will make. But just don't move your eye away from the poor. Don't move your eye from the poor because the benefits you are getting of being the person that you and the accumulation of wealth and so on that you've got is much more. The poor only want food and drink and shelter. Guess what? You're a chief executive, whether in government or in private sector. Guess what they give you for accommodation? Company house. The poor company house. You're a CEO, you're an executive somewhere. Guess what? When you are up there, what do you get? Company car. The poor? Zubko. <laughs> and they wake up what time? 3 a.m. to go into a queue. Did you notice what, what, what happens? 3 a.m., 2 a.m., people are already queuing up for Zubko which leaves at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. You just say, ah, yeah, 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 I was nearly late. Get into the car, and guess where you are? You drive off. When you are privileged, <laughs> hey, let me cut it a little bit there. When you are privileged, you're unlikely going to be in a queue for fuel. Where are the poor? In a queue. <laughs> Let me stop right there. I think, I think this, is not, this is not exciting. It's no longer. But that is the reference. So when you have the poor in your midst, please do not remove your eye from them. God loves us when we give to the poor, when we touch the hearts of the poor. In a... 
Did you know that you will blow up for lunch the same amount a poor person just wants for living for a whole month? Did you know that? So if you sacrifice the lunch date and gave it to the poor, guess what? God gets delighted. It's an offering. Get, God gets delighted to say, look, you are now lending to me. I will pay you back. I wanted to dwell there a little longer. Let me keep going. Deuteronomy 24, verse 21 to 20. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, uh, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Gleaning. So this is, today is Boaz field day again. I hope you have left a bit. I hope you brought something extra today. Not for yourself, not for somebody else, but for the poor. We have Shama children's home, we have Otter children's home. Shama children, they don't need much. When we give them, last month I think we gave them about $4,000, uh, guess what? That made a whole change in their lives. $4,000. Same dollars. Gave them food shelter, school fees, and so on and so forth. So, Boaz practiced this and became a forebearer of Christ. You see what, what, what God does? So, you give to the poor. You give to the needy. Naomi and Ruth come back, and then they say, we're going to glean. Here's what jo uh, Boaz says. Let me just, you, you need to capture the heart of a giver first. Understand what it does. The heart of a giver is not out there to trade. The heart of a giver is looking at the, 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 the condition and is looking at the plight of the, of the welfare of the, of, the, of, of the poor. Here is Ruth chapter 9, verse 8 to 9. And Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter. Will you not? Do not glean in another field. No, go from here, but stay close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. He gave beyond just the gleaning. Remember, further on, he had to ask, earlier on, he had to ask his reapers to say, drop much more now. There is a poor man in your midst. Drop a little bit more um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, of the sheaves and say, look, there is, there is a lady who must pick up all this. Actually, Naomi said, where did you glean? Because she came with buckets and a and, 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 and whole heap of, of, uh, of these uh, um, sheaves. And she was shocked. She said it was Boaz filled. So you've got to gauge the heart of a giver. I will protect you because people give out of trying to manipulate. But he says, I will protect you from the young men, but I will also provide for water so that you are not struggling there. Go and glean. Sacrificial offering. Sacrificial offering is giving a seed for the promotion of the kingdom of God sacrificially. That means the offering is big enough for you to feel it emotionally, spiritually, materially. This is not the regular tithe or normal offering. It is a sacrifice that makes you feel the, the cost that David did. It's a, it's a sacrifice. It is painful. You, you are actually doubting within yourself, should I, should I not, should I, should I not, should I, should I not. It is painful. You know if you gave, there's a whole lot of things that you're going to sacrifice. Sacrificial. 2 Samuel 24, verse 24. Then the king said to Arauna, no, but I surely buy it from you for a price. No, will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen uh, for 50 shekels of silver. He didn't want to just be given the money, given the threshing floor, and just did what he needed to do to sacrifice there. 
Abraham gave a sacrifice to God when he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. As a result, God saw an oath um, of a blessing upon him. So that was David. Abraham, Genesis 22, verse 15 to 18. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. He had to emphasize your only son. He didn't have ten sons. He says one is, yeah, is not so bad. I'll, be, I'll remain with uh, nine. Your only son, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham went with his only son to sacrifice him. He was not hoping that this would not work. He had made up his mind that he was losing a son. Painful as it was, him carrying the fire, his son carrying the wood, it was painful all the way up. But he did not relent. He did not look back. As he was about to sacrifice, God says, hold. And now, this is what happens. But you must also understand that this was a preamble. When we read earlier on in Ezekiel chapter 36, it says, look, uh, for the firstborn you ought to redeem. God knew that you would never have to sacrifice the firstborn because that sacrifice was always meant for one person and one person alone. There was only going to be one firstborn to be sacrificed and that firstborn is Jesus, the Son of God. So he reserved that privilege for his own son. So when you give something sacrificially, God tends to redeem it for you. He redeems it. Sacrificial offerings are usually sown in tears, but the results are sweet and too conspicuous to deny. When you do a sacrificial giving, and let me tell you, sacrificial giving, you, you don't do it in public because you are rejoicing. Sacrificial giving is when you just realize, have I done the right thing? And then what? There have been those instances, my wife and I would look at each other and say, what have you just done? <laughs> and then what? Now, where are we going to get this? But somehow, God has a redemptive process around it when you lose the very last thing you needed to use for something else, whether it was money, whether it was a car, or something material, and something significant for your own well-being, God tends to redeem. Psalm 126, verse 5 to 6, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So when you do it in private, you come back in, in public rejoicing that we did this and God has demonstrated his faithfulness. <coughs> <coughs> Last, as I finish off, there's a prophet offering and then next week we deal with a New Testament offering. So we're dealing with the Old Testament mirror of what God did or requested as offerings. But the prophet Offering, I call it the prophet offering. The prophet offering is an offering that you give to a man of God in appreciation of his service or in order to attract some kind of virtues that he carries. I wanted to finish off with this one because uh, I think I'm going to call for, an, uh, for a prophet's offering for the pastor today. I'm just joking. But I want to bring context and the correct balance to all this. Because sometimes we have swung the pendulum to the extreme. Where a man of God just come up here and says, yes, uh, uh, we, we, the man of God wants to go to, to Singapore. There is missionary work to be done here. And yet we can't even pay our electricity bills. Um, and then we must pay first class ticket and so on. Or the man of God wants a car. Uh, for him and another car for his wife, and we all fall over each other. We buy those things. 
and then the man of God wants this, the man of God wants that. Okay, that's stuck to the other extreme. The other extreme is that there is no request at all, or there is no desire to bless those who minister to you. There's, and let me just put the word, there is no desire. There is no alertness. There is no consciousness to actually say we have these men and women who serve us. Now and again, I need, in my own volition, not because there is now an appeal in church, in my own volition to go to the pastor, to the elder, and say, you know, I just came to drop this Mazoe two liter. Just to say thank you for all you do to us. Now everyone gets quiet, no amen, because we don't do it here. Because we don't do it here. We expect the pastors and the elders to be self-sustaining. No, God actually <laughs> has put you in our midst to make sure that you look after the shepherds. You look after those who lead you. They, they, they deserve double honor. But because we have swung the pendulum to the other extreme, guess what happens? There's no need to worry about them. You need to concern yourself over the workers and the, in the laborers in the harvest, those who minister to you. And in the New Testament, it is, it is actually much more encouraged there. In the Old Testament, the widow at Zarephath, in uh, 1 Kings 17, 10, uh, and the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4, verse 1 to 37. They, they were two people that enjoyed a prophetic blessing by reason of what they gave to the prophets. So when you look at the, the, the widow uh, of Zarephath was about to eat and die. And the prophet says, give it to me. She sacrificed her last meal, but guess what happens eventually? She was blessed of the Lord many times over. There is a place to bless these men of God. There is a place to bless your pastors. You don't have to do it with a razzmatazz kind of fanfare. Hey, yangui, mkono wangui, a hundred dollars. You don't have to bring mkono here, but... Just in your own way, go and bless these men and women. Your home group leader. Whenever my wife and I visit other leaders, because we're grateful for what they do to us, we always carry something with us. Always. Is it a, is it drink? Is it what? Just bring it along and actually say thank you very much. But it's not to say, look, let's not drink. If I brought a drink, we must not drink it there. We would rather drink what you had prepared. If you had prepared water for us, we'll drink the water. But don't look at it as if, oh, we knew you wouldn't have a drink, so we brought our own drink. No. It is just to say, drink this with your own family. Get along there. Bring a bag of mealy meal to them. Bring money, even if you don't know what they might need. Just leave them with money and say, look, you know what? We just want to say thank you for all you do for us. Never go there or visit one another. Just empty-handed. Hands in your pocket. Yeah, what did you bring? <laughs> Learn to give back. That's a prophetic offering, and you find what happens in these two widows. And, and the, the example that these were widows who were destitute. It's amazing. They still gave. And guess what? They got the blessing of the prophet. Jesus actually succinctly puts it. He says, he who receives a prophet in the name of the prophet, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 41, um, shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of the righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. What is that? So it's very broad. It could be spiritual, it could be material. You get that blessing? Look after those who look after you. Amen? Amen? So this is just teaching I wanted us to get from the Old Testament. Next week, we'll deal with the New Testament giving. There you want to brace up. Because the New Testament tells us to give everything. So come with your everything here. Your houses, we're going to sell them. 
your cars, we're going to sell them. None of this will clean your car and then you pay us. No, the car now belongs to the church. The New Testament, the car now. As you drive in next week, just know this car now belongs to the church. And I want to see all your registration books here with us. And then we do what the Bible says. Then the apostles did as they pleased. And don't be like Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> and retain some of it because there are zealous young men that God will raise to next week who will just come and pick you up because you have dropped dead and you have left some of it out. <laughs> if you've got two cars, please may your wife drive the other and you drive the other. Uh, there will be enough parking next week. But anyway, I'm just joking. But just know that God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let's just stand up together. Let's stand up together. Oh, hallelujah. Father, your word tells us that we must be cheerful givers. And you love a cheerful giver. And that we ought to give generously. We ought to sow generously and not sparingly. Lord, we ask that you would ignite that fire in our hearts to give. Even in this season where things could be very tough for each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that you give us that heart to give. That we will look out to the widow, to the fatherless, to the poor. We look out for the needs of the kingdom, the projects that you've given to us as a church. You look out for the needs of the shepherds. And that, Lord, we will be able to bless them because these are your servants too. We ask that we look out for the needs of each and every one of us, our neighbor, the person next to us, what their needs are, and be joyful in our giving. Lord, let the spirit of giving, of joyful giving, flow through us. In Jesus' name we pray.